I'm delighted to be here. I uh, 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 greatly, greatly appreciate the, the opportunity to talk about this issue. It's my first talk um, in the new era, uh, the new political era on this, on this topic. The picture there is a sign um, in a probation office uh, in, in Minnesota, just as a kind of a serious reminder that voting is a felony if you're currently under supervision. Um, the, uh, uh, and I, and I, I sent out a little abstract. I mean, I've the, the, been thinking a lot now. I, I do some expert testimony you know, on behalf of people who are charged with illegal voting. And the, uh, uh, I've, I've had the, the strange experience in Hennepin County, maybe it won't surprise the law professor so much, but of testifying on behalf of people who had been disenfranchised by virtue of their felony conviction. I gave my whole uh, uh, 20 minutes of testimony and judge thanked me, everything was going well. The prosecutor in closing said, I agree with almost everything the professor says, um, uh, and yet the law is the law. I have to prosecute these cases, I'm duty bound. And he said, but I will go with the professor to the legislature to advocate for changing them, but I must enforce the voting law. Um, and so I, I do want to kind of pull up um, the, the uh, 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 or at least pull up that issue and, and probably circle back to it later on. Um, one thing to know, there's been a ton of change in felon disenfranchisement law. So I started studying this in the mid 90s, I guess, and the uh, uh, late 90s. And at least half the states have changed since then. Um, you know, over a million people have had their rights restored. The direction of change has generally been toward restoration. Um, I mentioned the 343 unlawful voters that uh, uh, have been prosecuted in my home state. Um, and it's kind of strange, you know, we have long probation sentences. And so you know, one guy was on probation for nine years and 10 months of a 10 year pr probation sentence and he voted and he got a new felony conviction for voting. So. It is, it is a, a, a serious issue. Um, the, uh, uh, in October, we released new numbers uh, in advance of the election with the Sentencing Project, uh, Mark Maurer's organization, for those of you who know. Um, so I'll say, I'll say a bit about that. Um, and that's available if you know, folks have questions about um, some of these estimates by states. Um, we try to kind of catch up with the, with the change, at least through last fall, um, and provide some you know, statistical estimates. The, um, I'll, I'll say a bit, I don't know too much of the history in Ohio, but I'll try to drop that in when I, when I can. The, um, I often do these uh, 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 presentations, public presentations, and I'll, I'll have clickers. You know, many of you use clickers in the classroom, et cetera, and I'll see kind of where people are at before I even start. You know, I say, well, what about, this is, this is a, a, a question I gave on a national public opinion poll with Jeff Manza and tried to play it down the middle so you can see the wording when we're asking about public opinion. Um, people convicted of a crime who are in prison should have the right to vote. Others say they should not. How do you think? What do you think about that? Um, we ask a separate subset of people about um, people who've served their entire sentence, who are former felons, um, whether they should have the right. Um, then we ask about specific crimes, illegal trading of stocks, um, violence, violent crimes. Uh, the most stigmatized group is sex offenders. What do people feel about sex offenses? It, do, are they sensitive to the type of crime in, in kind of extending the franchise? Um, then we ask about community supervision and two types of community supervision, probation, um, people who are in, uh, uh, in the community but their freedom is conditional on kind of good behavior and then parolees who have done their time in prison but they've still got, they've still, um, uh, have yet to complete their sentence. Um, they remain supervised. So we ask about probation and we ask about parole, both, both of those, because each of those is a separate category for most uh, uh, states. So, you know, are there tough calls for people? Do they, is it difficult to, um, for them, do they draw lines and distinctions here? Um, that I'll, I'll speak in law school. Sometimes I'll do continuing legal education on some of these questions and, and get a, a rather diverse audience. Um, universities 
They tend to be uh, a, a little more favorable to, to voting rights uh, than, than other audiences. Um, not, not always, not exclusively though. Um, and it's interesting, we haven't done anything recently, but I've, I'm, I've often been curious whether this context or the threats of voter fraud, or the amplification of perceived voter fraud, if that's coloring people's views on these issues. So uh, we haven't fielded a new, a new survey in a while. Oops, let's see if we, uh, there we go. So I'm gonna go through a few questions that we started talking about, and please interrupt, you know, please just holler if there's something strikes you. I'll talk about how many are affected, about some of the origins in the United States and the United States peculiar history, um, this, these public opinion data, and then something just from talking with prisoners, probationers, parolees, uh, uh, and doing some survey work, how they care about voting. And then um, one question that often comes up for me as a criminologist is whether voting is related to crime. So I'll, I'll, I'll hit on that as well. So the um, if we look across the U.S., we could do this in our, we could do this like a classroom. I don't want to put people on the spot, but um, what's the most common felon voting policy across the 50 states? What's the most common regime? Yeah. Yes. Prison, parole, and probation. Any others? Uh... Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. I thought it was like. You I thought? thought like, once you commit a felony, you're done. Yeah, and that is the case in some states. Okay. That is the case in some states, but these right. You 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 you've been reading some stuff. That's right. So most states, uh, well, I shouldn't say most states. The plurality of states, um, you're disenfranchised while you're on paper. They'll say, you know, you're you're in the community. Um, and so here's the 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 roster as of October 2016. Um, uh, you can see Ohio is in the prison only group. Um, Minnesota, my home state, is in the prison parole and probation group, and the, the post-sentence restrictions, those tend to be, there's a, there's a geographic clustering there, um, and particularly states like Florida um, uh, uh, have, have a large number of felons. So um, across the world, now this is another question that came up, how does this look across the world? Globally, as many nations at least as I could, I could track down um, these, these rules. Um, is it uh, uh, different than the United States? It's more restrictive, yeah. So do they restrict prisoners? Do they restrict parole? Vote for B, prison only, correct. Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, and you know, it's interesting, there's a fair number of uh, nations around the world, and I'll show uh, in a moment, that permit prisoners to vote um, and actually have fairly high turnout. So um, this is a little old. I haven't updated this since 2009, but you can see, um, you know, if I crudely dichotomize things into whether they have a general disenfranchisement pr provision, um, that there's a, no a large number of nations in the EU that permit prisoners to vote. That's sort of been the move in the last, uh, in, in recent decades. Um, the, uh, uh, but there's some texture around a lot of these estimates. I mean, I, to tell you how that conversation is different, I spoke at a conference in uh, Barcelona last year where the debate was not whether prisoners should vote because they had a constitutional right to vote, but it was whether prisoners should be able to hold office and they were talking about technology, and they were talking about all sorts of things. That's not a conversation that I've heard in the United States, you know. Um, <laughs> that, that's right, that's right. You, you have kind of a revolving door there. So, okay, but if we think about it, um, the, across the United States, if we add up all of those different regimes and put them into a pie chart, where are the numbers? So which, is the, which of these groups is the largest? E. Yeah, the post-sentence. Okay, so, and the reason for that is, is because, you know, you're disenfranchised for life. And so it's basic demography. Every year there's a new cohort of felons being minted. 
And we know, and I'll talk about this in my talk tomorrow, about the age crime curve and, and how people desist from crime as they get older. But this means, I looked at a sample for um, Johnson v. Bush, a, a, a federal voting rights act case. I looked at the, the Florida um, kind of petitions to have your rights restored. And there are, there are millions of middle class Americans out there who have a felony conviction in their history. And, and um, they extend all throughout the life course. So that's where the most numbers are. Um, and here's just sort of a basic pie. It's about half, about three million people are post-sentence. Um, it's only about a fourth are currently incarcerated. Um, and then uh, parole and probation makes up that other fourth. But I have to say, there's a, there's a ton of state variation. Like in anything in criminal justice, it just, it's, it's really uh, uh, 51 separate systems. Um, so here is, you know, my home state of Minnesota, it's the land of, you know, 10,000 probationers. Um, we put people on probation for a very long period of time. We're stingy with prison beds. And so, you know, two thirds or more are on felony probation. Um, in Ohio, it looks a little different. Um, it's all prison. You know, there's, there's a small number of convicted jail inmate, or convicted felons who are serving, serving sentences in jail that would be counted as well. Um, Florida, this is, this is the, where the real numbers are. It's this post-sentence, you know, about a million and a half um, by our counting. And so we, we use demographic techniques to kind of track people as they leave prison, adjust it for death, for recidivism, for mobility, et cetera. Um, and and that, those numbers just accumulate uh, uh, it, it rather quickly over time. Um, so the, if you look kind of across the states, there's all of this legal change. And, um, and so states are, are changing their laws. Um, their, their correctional populations are getting, going up and down. But right now, it's, it's about 6.1 million, near as, near as we can tell. Um, which is the, the kind of rate of change is starting to taper off as uh, correctional populations have actually declined a bit um, in the Obama years. Um, so if we look across the state. Is the decline early on there? Yeah. To the changes and states all about That's right. So, so, you know, you get into the civil rights era here, and I'll show in a moment kind of where those, there's, those laws were changing. That is an effect, there, there's basically stability in incarceration from the 60s to the early 1970s, and then it sort of took off. But that part is, is a liberalization of the laws. So, the, um, so if we go back to 1980, you know, most states, this is a, as a percentage of the voting age population, how many people are disenfranchised by virtue of a felony conviction. Um, it's about, it was less than 2% in most states, but you can see some regionalization already in the southeast. It's a heavier concentration of, of former felons. Um, if you get out to 2016, um, now we're, we're up to about 2.5% of the electorate. That was 1980, 1980. So it, this was, uh, we, could, we started to get much better data in the 1970s. Our estimates before then are a little shaky. I, I mean, I, I don't quite trust them as well as the ones uh, starting in 1980. So the, um, so here you can see, you know, we're, we're um, uh, around 10% in some states um, of the electorate is disenfranchised because they have a history of felony conviction. Now, the, um, if we move ahead, this is, this is a cartogram, kind of a geographic information systems technique for those of you who you know, this where you adjust the area boundaries uh, uh, for a statistic, in this case for the, the rate of disenfranchisement, and it gives you a sense for the regionalization, I think. And so there is kind of a disenfranchisement belt in, in the south and east. And you can see, you know, Maine shrivels, uh, 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 as do many other states. Ohio is a little less prominent here um, be, because only, only prisoners are disenfranchised. Um, this is the growth kind of overall. This is an article um, uh, that should be coming out in demography. The, um, if we just look at the current felons, people currently under supervision, 
And then the former felons on top of that, you can, you can get to a class of approximately 20 million people in the United States. Um, and those former felon numbers are gonna kinda keep, can, keep going up even as our current numbers taper off um, because so many people are in the system and will be released in, in coming years. Um, so if we look at the, in 1980, this was um, how many ex-felons there were total in the population. And this is not, with, without regard to their disenfranchisement status, it was about 2% of the electorate. Um, now it's about 6.5% of the electorate. Well, in 2010 it was about 6.5%. Um, the, the racial dynamics, though, are, are much stronger. So even in 1980, we had very high rates of felony conviction among African Americans. We have long had uh, uh, disparities, racial disparities in the system. Um, so, in, and here the regionalization is different. It's the north central region, Minnesota, Wisconsin, um, Iowa often, that have the highest uh, disproportionality in punishment. Um, even in 1980, it was 5.5%, but if we go up to 2010, it's about 18%. Um, of vo the voting age population has a felony conviction. And that's both for male and female. That's male and female. So the male rates are, are significantly higher. Yeah. The, uh, 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 and this is partly a reflection. I say this because you know there's we talk about mass incarceration, but really then what a lot of people are looking at now is mass probation. That people are kind of on paper for, for a long period of time, and and it's. Uh, 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 and they haven't been as considered in the research literature. So on, with regard to political impact, does it make a difference, right? Well, I showed you the numbers on Florida, and I think you know, some of you might remember we had a very close election in, that came down to Florida in 2000. Um, you know, it, it's clear, so we published a paper in 2002 on this showing you know, that um, it, felon disenfranchisement would likely have made the difference. What we did was we, we sort of counted the disenfranchised. We modeled their turnout for the modal felon voter using um, uh, uh, the current population survey and some other data. And then we looked at the uh, uh, predicted the partisan vote choice. So who would they have voted for? Now this, the main factor here was race because there is a, there's been a strong preference among African Americans for Democratic Party candidates um, uh, in, recent, in recent elections. Um, and so we, then we would uh, recalculate the election results by uh, uh, modeling the voting behavior of those who had been left out, their likely turnout, uh, et cetera. And so we, we uh, uh, can point to the Bush election, Bush v. Gore. Um, it, it likely, if we go back to the, uh, uh, the Kennedy-Nixon election, that was close enough that we did a counterfactual in which if we were punishing at the same rate we did, uh, in 2000, the, it, in, in 1960, that election could have been different as well. And then we, we examined the, um, the U.S. Senate races. And it only makes a difference, I should say it only makes a difference, it, it can only determine the election really in very close elections, narrow victories by Republicans in states that have really strict laws. Um, and so, you know, John Warner was first elected to the Senate. Um, Likely, felon disenfranchisement made a difference. Uh, uh, Tower in Texas, Mitch McConnell in Kentucky, um, and so forth. Now, here we're building kind of, uh, we're, we're, we're getting a little far down the road with the counterfactual, and we kind of accumulated the gains in the Senate, and said it could have affected the, the, uh, the balance of power in the Senate. Um, others have done um, uh, similar analyses it, with somewhat lower turnout estimates. And, and you know some of those elections um, are, are pretty borderline, but it's it's it certainly in principle um, can affect elections have a real impact. And when you're talking about six million people, even if their turnout rate is relatively low, if they have any kind of preference at all, it could make a difference. Um, now the the so so where did the laws come from? Here we did, we mentioned race in the introduction, I think, I think it's, it's kind of a smoking gun in a way that there's, there's, there's cases in particular states where you can find, okay, they, that the, the record is really clear that, that there was uh, uh, races behind the law. 
Um, why you say that? Well, um, the, the peculiarities of, of uh, uh, US racial politics and the um, Jim Crow era, um, uh, that we had very strong statements on disenfranchisement. We also did a statistical analysis, though, that showed this, that states were really likely to pass one of these restrictions as their African American prison populations crept up. And it, was, it depended on time. And so it really mattered after 1870. So when African American males got the right to vote, then a, a large number of uh, 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 restrictions were passed. And so there's not a clear historical record in a lot of states. And I'm not a historian. I mean, I've, I've, I've tried to dig in as much as I can. I'll show you some of what I've, what I've come up with. But, the, um, but we can say, at least statistically, this is the pattern. Um, and then the, the two states that, are, that really permit prisoners to vote, that have the, you know, the, the least restrictions, are Maine and Vermont, two of the, the whitest states in, in the United States. So I'll show you the, um, the era in which I sort of uh, uh, tipped, tipped my hand there. This is 1850 to 1900 when most of these were passed. Um, so, the, so this is a, the, the hazard rate or the, the, kind of the, the probability that a restrictive law was passed by decade. Okay, so the, there's a lot of action, what I want to point out, in the 1860s, 1870s, um, 1880s even. Uh, we saw a fair number of restrictions being passed. And then it, it bounces along, and there's still restrictions being passed today, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention a couple of them. Um, this, this chart is when the laws were kind of liberalized. Okay, so when the restrictions were pared back, so states might have gone from having a general lifetime prohibition to then just re disenfranchising prisoners. And here you get this, this blip up in the 1960s, 1970s. So kind of the Voting Rights Act era, um, you saw some of these laws falling by the wayside, as, as did all sorts of other disenfranchising measures. Um, but unlike you know poll taxes and grandfather clauses, um, the felon disenfranchisement is, is a much more active uh, area today. Although I shouldn't say that. I mean, <laughs> I'm going to catch myself. I said my, my first talk in 2017 on this subject. Um, so this, this will be very difficult to read, but I just wanted to give you some of the flavor of the history of, kind of the Jim Crow rhetoric around the um, uh, uh, disenfranchisement in 1890s um, that the uh, 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 the, you see, hear this language about obviating all future danger and fortifying the Anglo-Saxon civilization against every assault and, and calling a, a constitutional question to deal with suffrage. Um, if you go into the 1980s uh, and in, in more recently, um, it's much more of what sociologists call a laissez-faire racism. It just so happens if it's blacks losing the right to vote, then they have to quit committing crimes. That, the, that's the sentiment that, that you hear today. And I'll show you, you know, just because a couple of these, these figures are really key are, are um, Mitch McConnell um, in the upper right there, um, say those who break our laws should not dilute the vote of law-abiding citizens. And this, this is often cited, this logic of the purity of the voting stream is one of the chief arguments that uh, uh, proponents of disenfranchisement make. And then here, um, Jeff Sessions, our new attorney general, um, uh, weighed in with kind of a state's rights argument, um, saying that, the, uh, uh, that Congress shouldn't step in with a sledgehammer and smash something we've had from the beginning of the country's foundation, um, a set of election laws in every state. Um, so, so this, I think, is how the laws have been justified in, in recent years, um, as opposed to kind of the, the stark racist speech that we might have seen um, in earlier eras. Recently, though, there's lots of action. As I said, Maryland um, re-enfranchised most of the people on community supervision this year. Um, California, jail inmates get the right to vote. Um, uh, Virginia, it's been back and forth. A lot of the action lately has been at the executive branch. So 
the governor, uh, uh, McAuliffe in Virginia, um, had a, uh, said, I'm just gonna do a blanket uh, uh, restoration of civil rights for those who are beyond their period of sentence. Um, Supreme Court in Virginia said he couldn't do that. He had to go back. Um, Iowa, very similarly, um, Governor Vilsack uh, uh, did a restoration of civil rights, said um, uh, uh, for anybody who's, who's uh, uh, off paper, they can now vote. Um, he continued to do that um, each month as people would emerge, uh, 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 emerge or, or, or leave supervision. Um, then his successor uh, reversed that practice, and so now we have to count people in Iowa as, as disenfranchised again. The, yeah, John. Sorry, finish your thought. No, no, please. I, I, I can't remember what happened in that. I call it a shutdown by the Supreme Court. I didn't understand that they were raising the issue of the dumbness. Yeah, he... He did. There was a subset that was carved out. Others might know too. That that um, I think he got to several thousand at least. I want to say I want to say twelve thousand, but it may have been more like four thousand. That that he could individually do them. And this had been a, a particular class. They might have been people who had had uh, uh, registered, or it it was it was a defined class that he that he he did. And he you know vowed to do those before the election and. I didn't follow up to see, but I think I think a fair number were, um, you know. And, and my research assistants, we don't like it when there are all these uh, complications. We like it very clean. But many of the states now are disenfranchising for particular offenses, or they're disenfranchising for recidivists, or they're having a five-year waiting period, or a two-year waiting period, or things like that, which makes it a little more complicated to estimate these uh, these state populations. Um, South Dakota, interestingly, um, disenfranchised probationers. That's a move toward a new restriction. I think, you know, I, I, I would predict that we'll see moves in a lot of the states. We may see a move in Ohio to disenfranchise uh, uh, people on supervision. Um, it, it, it could very well be the case given, as I say, people, some of the national leaders and where they stand on these issues and um, uh, efforts to kind of uh, restrict the electorate in other areas. Um, if you add it all up, though, regardless of you know the the um, the historical record here, it's about seven and a half percent of the African American voting age population cannot vote by virtue of a felony conviction, and that's relative to about one point eight percent of all other groups. So roughly four times as much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I was right. Right. Well, that, that's been the story that I've told for a few years, that you know, there, is, there, there is greater changes to the reenfranchisement than the disenfranchisement, that that's been the direction. But it, the, the, to me, it's striking that, 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 um, that some of the major proponents of disenfranchisement are now you know, the Senate Majority Leader and the Attorney General um, and the, the, the um, uh, uh, as well that, that uh, I've just heard more, you know, more of the people who are, uh, who call me to testify in these things are in more of a defensive posture than, um, or, now, now I will say that in our, you know, quantitative analysis of, of um, liberalizing these laws or, or paring back the restrictions, Partisan politics was a relatively weak predictor. So that surprised us. We thought, okay, you know, anytime you mess with 
the electorate that the parties have a, a vested interest in it. But, it. but it was complicated because the Democrats really don't want to be seen as soft on crime. And it, it, and it was Republican governors like George W. Bush in Texas who had the political cover to sign off on reenfranchisement. And then it was, you know, Republicans like uh, Charlie Crist before he became a Democrat. He was trying to pair this back in Florida. Um, and so, so, so there, there was, uh, uh, I, the politics are undeniable here, but the, but I just say it doesn't predict nearly as well as say the racial compositions of the prison. That, and, and that's, that's the, you know, the, the Democrats don't want to be tarred with the, the brush of the criminal. And, and you know, the, I was asked when I testified um, uh, uh, in, in Minnesota whether um, the, the, the provision that would reenfranchise probationers would apply to those convicted of treason. And, you know, so, so do you want to vote on behalf of the treasonous? Um, right. Right. Yeah, I'll get there in a minute. Yeah, yeah. That's that's those are good good questions. And I I mean I think I think as we go uh, uh, look to the future. So I'll just say overall, here's the African American. Um, uh, uh, percentages in 1980, 2.9%, now 7.4%. Um, and, you know, Ohio's around 2.5%, about the same 4 to 1 ratio, um, but not, uh, not a particularly high incarceration state here relative to the, the rest of the nation. Um, so I, I'm going to skip over the, the Minnesota one, but I did want to call your attention to the fact that this isn't an urban issue. It's not just you know your the electorate in the major cities. Um, in fact, um, if we look and, and here's the the Twin Cities areas down here in this part of the state, the um, that we have very high rates of disenfranchisement. Um, uh, it depends on on the ethnic group. We have high rates of American Indian disenfranchisement in the northern part of the state. We have uh, high rates of African American disenfranchisement throughout the state, um, and this, these sorts of um, presentations seem to be important uh, uh, to to uh, uh, the, our state legislators are when they were thinking about well how should we mobilize on this issue and talk about well we're talking about people in our hometown here these probationers and parolees, um, so one of the things that I'll typically do and. I, I'm afraid you'll have to do this in reverse in Ohio, but if the law were to change. So this is, this is the racial disparities under conditions of um, where you disenfranchise the probationers and parolees. Okay, this is disenfranchising community supervision. We get about 7% African American and 6% American Indian. Um, if we pair that back to just prisoners and went with the law that Ohio has, it would be about 2.5%, two, two 2%. The disparities would remain, that, that those ratios would remain, but it would really reduce that vote dilution that communities of color are experiencing right now. Uh, so the, um, now I'll get to the, the poll data quickly. The, here's our basic finding. Now we split the sample four ways so we wouldn't contaminate the answers, you know, when we asked about these different um, categories. Um, we had about 80% favored um, the ex-felons being able to vote. So once, you're, once you've completed your time, you should be able to vote. We were a little surprised by that. We thought, we didn't think it would be as high. It's, uh, Americans are rather punitive um, on, on a, lot of, a lot of issues. Um, and similarly with probationers and parolees. So um, probationers, it was over two thirds. Uh, parolees, about 60%. It was a good national poll, but now it's getting old. It was, I think we published this in 2004. Um, so we don't know to, to what extent this has changed. Probation and parole seems flip-flop. Do people not understand the difference between probation and parole? Was that explained in the poll? Well, yeah, it was in the, in the way that we said it. I mean, in the way that, that I mentioned it with people who were supervised in the community 
Yeah, yeah. Your place is a probation. You're on probation. You're serving your sentence. Parole. You basically served your time, and this would be just uh, supervision after. Yeah. But but I think it does. I think that you've got the stigma of the prison, and you must have done something really bad to get to prison, right? So I, I so that didn't didn't surprise me too much. But I, I see that point. It, here, where you get to the prison gate, though, that's where people kind of get off the train, right? So so it's not the case that Americans would favor overall general dis general reenfranchisement across the board or severing the link between punishment and uh, 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 voting altogether. Um, uh, whether one and three is a lot or a little depends. But so, so the, um, this one's probably fairly easy. Which, which do you think is the offense category people are most likely to be, to, uh, for, uh, for C, white collar crime? Uh, it's actually unspecified. So this, this, and this is kind of a public opinion thing. If you give any detail and they start thinking about it, they're like, oh, I don't really like those guys, you know? Like, uh, uh, so here's, here's how, it, how that shook out. We actually, um, it was 80% for our generic person convicted of a crime. And you know, the activists on the left and the right, I, I mean, they portray, you know, the, um, uh, uh, the, the They'll portray the felon population as you know the one-time marijuana smoker or something is is the modal felony for felon for those who want to change the liberalize the law, and then um, Mitch McConnell used the term murderers, rapists, terrorists, and spies is who we're talking about, you know, which is not a large percentage of the population. <laughs> um, but even I mean this 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 finding surprised us um, that 52 percent. We went for the, the, the hyper stigma here. I mean, it's a, if you're convicted of a sex offense, that's, that's almost a caste-like status in American society. And even, even, even there, if you'd done your time, most people thought it was okay that you should vote. Yeah. Yeah, that, that is a... Uh, uh, it's it's a small difference. I don't know if that difference is sig statistically significant. Right. Yeah. I think the the there's not a lot of sympathy for <laughs> for white collar criminals. Uh, but you're right. I mean that, that we expected the gradient to be the other way. This was uh, uh, Enron era, you know. So to, to <laughs> so. You know, I think there were some, some publicized cases. This was 2004, I think was, I can't remember when we fielded, but that was a publication date. Um, and we, it clearly needs redoing. Um, so the, the meaning, you know, if we talk through, well, how much is it on a radar for people? Um, we've got some survey data um, that I can kind of summarize quickly that there's much lower turnout among people who've had exposure to the criminal justice system, even where they can vote. They're less trusting of the government, and they have lower levels of political efficacy. Um, I think, and, and my, you know, my data is collected in places where there are a lot of independents, but they may be more likely to self-identify as political independents. So in a lot of my work, I have a binary vote choice model. I think it is a little, um, I think it is a little more complicated. Um, and the, the, uh, I can say more about that if people are interested. But there's a lot of work now on system avoidance, and um, uh, Veshla Weaver and Amy Lerman have a, have a wonderful book that I'm, I'm plugging there instead of my own book. On um, uh, basically, the farther you get into the system, the farther you get out of democracy. And and the you know so you can see people who are and I'll show you in a moment if you are incarcerated versus arrested versus never arrested. That on each, on each kind of basic national election study kind of indicator about confidence or trust in the government, the farther you get into the system, the less trust you have, um, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, and this, you know, I can show you more, more items like that about, it's, it's, a, it's a very alienated population in many ways. Um, uh, not just uh, uh, with regard to the, you know, the criminal justice system, but the state more generally. 
Um, so people really don't feel part of the conversation. And I'll just show, show a few quotes to give you the flavor of, of how people inside talk about it. Um, one of the things that amazes people in prison is that, um, that people outside of prison could think that there'd be some sort of voting block. That that makes no sense in, in prison, really. That, you know, we're going to, what's the fear? We're going to have some organized crime guy running for office and we're all going to get behind him. Um, that's not the case. Prison's about difference and, you know, and, and attitudes, even on crime, um, they're not significantly, people in prison are not significantly less punitive necessarily than others. Um, they want procedural justice, fairness, et cetera, but, um, but that doesn't make, doesn't make much sense. So they see a logic. Yes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, I, I think that's, that's right. There's, we have some work, I probably won't say too much about it tonight, but on democratic practice within prisons and how people, so there's a lot of elected leadership, what, I shouldn't say a lot, it varies state to state, but, the, the, um, uh, uh, but it's taken very seriously. You know? and, and so I, I gave a talk at the Oregon State Penitentiary and a you know, um, guy who was president of the Lifers Club, this was an, a position of, of some esteem. You you had you were negotiate with leadership and, and you had control over some resources, etc. And he said, every one of my constituents, everyone who voted for me has been convicted of taking a human life. I won't break a campaign promise. You know, that's a pretty serious thing. Um, also, I mean the the um, uh, 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 and when, when I've spoken in prison too, I do see diversity in terms of who people had voted for. A lot of, a lot of you know, mostly guys I'd say, uh, because that's, I've done this more with, with men, but a lot of them never had the chance to vote because you know, they were arrested around their 18th birthday, et cetera, um, very young. Um, but some, but some have, have had that experience and look forward to going back to it. Um, I think the big issue there is local elections. So if you have the prison in a small town, are they going to be able to outvote the sheriff? And you know, typically they would vote for their home community, you know, the, where they where they come from, rather than that in that uh, that local election. Right. Mm-hmm. The, the, you're right, I mean, I, I think, I, and I think that's a good way to put it. I mean, so, so the, but it, as I say, if you go into prisons, a lot of it is about difference. It's about groups and factions and who is with who, and, and, and so you, the, it's hard to see that from inside. The one place where I do see that, or, or where I see that as being a legitimate issue, was where um, uh, civil commitment, where people who had not lost the right to vote but were locked away essentially for life because of sex crimes. And they retained the right to vote in Minnesota, and, and there were hundreds of them. And so, th so there was talk about, okay, well, they're going to be a block, and I, you know, part of the problem is you were concentrating. You were civil, w w there was a federal uh, uh, lawsuit against our Minnesota sex offender program because people weren't getting out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think I think it does. I mean, I think if you, um, you know, I mean, my line on that is ninety-five percent plus of folks inside will be getting outside, and so the the preparing folks for citizenship is a really important thing to do. Um, the the uh, uh, but I I do think that I th I think those those attitudes color, and I, I'll say in a moment, kind of what messages seem to resonate more publicly or with, with uh, elected officials. Um, maybe, maybe I'll just move, move to that in a minute. Um, and, and, but remind me if I don't come back. <laughs> so uh, another, another familiar line, though, that I, I did want to get on the table is taxation without representation. This, particularly for people who are in the community on probation and parole, um, they, it, it, it is, Say, I, I have no right to vote on how my taxes are going to be spent or used. Um, uh, that uh, people will keep asking him what, he, what he's going to give back to the community, and he's like, I, the community doesn't want a damn thing to do with me. Okay, so that, that's a sense that, um, uh, of kind of fundamental unfairness for people um, who are, you know, especially on long time supervision. And then the racial element. Clearly, African American uh, men and women that I spoke with saw this right away. Um, said, you know, that if you look around the jail, you look around the prison, um, you see a lot of black faces, and so that leaves more uh, uh, for other races to vote. Um, so, I think it's it's a racial thing towards us. It's a white world. Okay, so so clearly, you know that. Those three lines, kind of that um, illogic, the the uh, taxation without representation, and then this racial wedge, those those would come out pretty consistently. Um, uh, I won't say too much about the crime model because um, it's very difficult to get a strong causal argument here um, because I'm not I can't really randomly assign. Um, uh, uh, people to be disenfranchised or not be disenfranchised, but I'll show you the pattern of association that um, we know in the general population that voters are far less likely to get into trouble. We know in Oregon where parolees and probationers can vote, we looked at successful completion. The people who start voting are far more likely to successfully complete. And when I matched voting and prison records, I found a, a strong time varying effect. So once people started voting, they were far less likely to be um, getting into trouble with the law. Now it was it was uh, a lot of people didn't start voting um, immediately upon release, but but it was uh, uh, it seemed to go along, and, and it was about the size of what we what we'd view the marriage effect being and. Um, so that is, so being married, you're less likely to, to recidivate. Um, if you're a voter, you're less likely to recidivate. Doesn't mean that, you know, pulling the ballot or filling out your form is, is what's causing you, but it's likely that voting is picking up some element of civic engagement and, and participation. Um, so the, uh, and I'll, I'll move through this uh, to just show some of the, the uh, relatively small differences in, in probation and parole. Um, but clearly, you know, the, the voters are not the ones you have to worry about. So if I testify on this issue, uh, I, I generally say it doesn't, it, it certainly will not increase crime to re-enfranchise people. The, so on these five questions, um, there is likely a political impact. I mean, the bigger impact I, that's harder to measure is how it shifts debate to take six million people out of the electorate, six million mostly poor, uh, in mostly poor folks, and disproportionately um, uh, from communities of color. It's close Republican victories in states with very strict laws. Um, there's ancient origins. I mean, people say disenfranchisement is as old as democracy. Um, it's uh, uh, but it's clearly tied to racial conflict in the U.S. Um, does the public really want strict voting laws? Not to the best of our knowledge, uh, but most only want inmates banned. So something like the Ohio system um, was, was the modal one favored in our, in our opinion polling. 
And then do felons care about voting? It's not necessarily at the top of the list, but it does carry a sting. And it does, um, that, to be turned away, I mean, I had one guy tell me he took his little daughter to vote with him and was turned away at, at her elementary school, I think, and was turned away and said, you know, he's never going to try that again. Um, you know, it was, it was humiliating. Um, uh, uh, is voting linked to crime? Well, it's certainly correlated, um, but that's not, that's not something that I could, I could um, say with you know, complete confidence. Um, so why would we re-enfranchise? Well, it could extend democracy. Um, you know, the, the steady kind of extension of the franchise in United States history. Um, we've argued that disenfranchisement, felon disenfranchisement is starting to reflect a reversal of that. Um, it could reduce racial disparity in ballot access, enhance or not compromise public safety, um, respond to public sentiment, accord with international standards, and serve some of these reintegrative goals. Now, some of these arguments, if you're interested in changing the law, work better than others, I'll, I'll say. Um, uh, I want to ask you just to think about, well, what should the law be in Ohio and in the US? I mean, um, across, you know, when I, when I present outside the US, there, people are very curious that each state has a different regime, different election laws that doesn't you know, it, it's, people ask, well, how is that constitutional? And I, I try to go through, you know, the, the limited case law I know. Um, uh, and then this is what I often ask the, uh, uh, the, the, the CLEs or the, the lawyers, um, you know, well, so my, my uh, prosecutor who was, who, who thought it was a bad law, uh, but, um, but was uh, 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 nevertheless prosecuting, um, what should he do? And how would you enforce this law as prosecutor? And this is one where the, the, the lawyers answer very differently than the social scientists. Right? Um, aggressively prosecute as a new felony, prosecute where there's clear evidence of intent, or resist prosecution. You know, what would you say? I'd probably go with me or something like, you know, if it's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, maybe, like, yeah. I text message or something that said, hey, I'm going to go illegally vote, man. Yeah, cool. Yeah, that's. Yeah. Well, no, you have to, by our law, you have to willfully uh, uh, vote. And so, the, the, so they did have to do some, they did have to investigate these. They couldn't just do the records match, and, and it, was, it was tricky. But the prosecutors, um, and say, well, I can't do this. Right? I can't resist prosecution on this. And it's actually, it's a crime for them to do that. Um, so not only would you know, they try, they'd be fired, but in Minnesota law, that, that they were, that, this, that voting laws were in a special category in, in which you know, there was far less discretion than, say, it's not like enforcing a prostitution law. And so I, I bring that up only to say that um, this, is a, this is an area where um, it's, it's likely that um, repeal would be the reform rather than to try to argue for non-prosecution, um, at least in the environments in which I'm working. Um, so the, so it, it really feels, though, like piling on. You know, I'm, I, I was sitting there next to you know, a 55-year-old guy who'd been on probation for a long time. He'd done nothing wrong. He's called in, you know, two o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon or something to, to go handle this this case. And then he heard heard the prosecutor's speech. He's like, "So what happens? He doesn't agree with the law. So what happens to me? You know, like, well, yeah, you get longer. You know, he got his probation extended by several years um, because because of that voting. And the um, but I will say there's many many paths here." The, the, particularly in the executive branch, that, um, that that's where um, we're seeing governors kind of getting out front on this. The story in Iowa was one of a, I mean, it's, I've heard this secondhand, so I, I think it's reliable, that it was actually a high school civics class that was lobbying uh, a bunch of state legislators to try to change the law. They weren't that interested, and so they started sending letters to the, uh, to the governor and the governor's council. Um, and, and the governor's council called me and said, I've got all these kids 
who are who are pestering me like every day and sending me your articles, and and I, I, I had nothing to do with that. You know, it wasn't it wasn't me. But the the um, but Vilsack was. I don't know if he was the first to do this, but it was it was a pretty um, it was a pretty big move, and and folks around the country were watching. So there's many strategies you can sever the link between um, voting and and punishment. Um, the the kind of intuitively appealing uh, one that fits the the uh, the public opinion data is you say when you're in you're in and when you're out you're out and we're kind of talking about that a bit about with the um, uh, uh, distinction between the prison gate or not. Um, I will say in terms of advocacy and framing that there's universal appeal to if you appeal to fairness, to basic rights, and to crime in the life course. And that, that, by that I mean uh, 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 people who've been law abiding for 30 or 40 years who nevertheless have this history of a conviction. It's very tricky to, um, to make the appeal on the basis of racial disparities uh, because as you do that, if I show those charts to uh, a, a public group, they'll say, well, that's just reflecting underlying criminality. That's just reflecting, it's not a system problem. That is uh, a, a, a racial differences problem. Um, and so, in a so, so that's where a social science audience is very different, uh, uh, perhaps, than an audience of legislator. Um, on the other hand, we know from how these laws get changed, it's the moral authority of the civil rights movement that often gets it done. It's the black church, it's groups that have um, black legislative caucuses. Um, they will keep the momentum going. Um, and because it doesn't look like a partisan vote grab. It doesn't look like it's just Democrats trying to get more Democratic votes. And that's, that's sometimes how people view activists on this issue if they don't have any kind of moral authority. And then I would say, you know, if you're doing any advocacy on this, don't say this is what France does, you know. That does not go over well, you know. I, I don't know Ohio as well as I know some other states, but um, but to say the United States is the only nation in the world that does this, you know, that's, that's, that's right. Isn't that great? Another thing we're number one at. So, um, so I, I think the, I will leave it right there and um, with our remaining time, I hope, you know, we can uh, engage some of these issues that I might have evaded. Yeah. Yeah. The, the history question I have is what you can say about the pre-Jim Crow, or, you know, the, the yeah. pre, even pre-Civil War experience. Mm -hmm. My relatively uninformed sense of this was that to the extent we really did disenfranchise felons mm -hmm. in the early days of our country, mm -hmm. it was less as a matter of formal legal doctrine and instead just practical that we didn't have absentee balloting. And mm. if you were in prison, you couldn't mm. vote because you were in prison, mm. not that you were legally disenfranchised. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I, 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 th I certainly think that's, that's a big barrier. The, the, um, in many state constitutions, it's written in. Um, so the, the, there, is a, there is an exclusion and, it's, and it, it'll say, sometimes it says felony or infamous crime. Sometimes it will say crimes of moral turpitude. Um, and, and, it, and this gives us a little leverage on some of these racial smoking guns because homicide will not be a disenfranchising offense, but trespassing or stealing chickens, or those sorts of things will. Um, and so there was one writer who said, you know, it, it is not the the um, robust crimes of whites, but the furtive crimes of the Negro that are disenfranchised, right? Um, so, the, so we can see in 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 some of those in some of those states we have that history. In others, you know, I don't know in Minnesota. I mean, I know it. It appeared relatively early on. I think you know it's early 19th century certainly for Ohio. If it if if 
when was statehood? Was it uh, 1802? So, you know, I, I think it was uh, 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 in the Constitution was the, uh, yeah, I, th I, th I think it goes, it goes back and, and like there, there is likely a historical record, but not one, you know, it's a great thing for a grad student to get on, you know, uh, uh, to try to dig up. Um, but, but that's interesting, the practical barriers. I mean, this is, that conversation reminds me a lot of the census conversation about where to count people for purposes. We talked about that a little bit before the talk that, you know, is um, you count people where they sleep for purposes of the census, and the census is, is very unlikely, or, or has been very resistant to changing that. Um, and the, the, uh, uh, the provision for absentee, you know, the, 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 when I go back into these 19th century records, it's, we're talking about like, a, you know, a dozen people, you know, a few people if, what, it, it, that, that, uh, that might be subject, and there's no probation or parole. You know, this is just, you're locked up. Um, so it is, it is a, uh, 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 and the last thing I'll say is just there's, there's often a, this unusual list of enumerated offenses that are disenfranchising that, you know, are, are a little bit, um, uh, uh, they're not like the unif FBI's uniform crime reports. Uh, uh, and so those have been interpreted in many cases, though, to mean felony as, as something that's punishable by up to a year in prison um, broadly. But, if you, if you go back into the Constitution, you'll see all sorts of things. And they vary a bit by state. Yeah, good question. Yeah? Statistics as to... Um, sorry, are there uh, statistics as to whether or uh, how often uh, prisoners vote compared to the rest of the population? Are they more likely to vote as prisoners or, or less? No, less likely. Significantly less likely. The big thing that um, accounts like accounts for that is education levels. So prisoners are far less educated, more educated people are more likely to vote. Um, I think there's also some scarring effects of this though. I think you, you know, the, the, the belief among prisoners in states where um, they often have the rights or they regain the rights is that they hear that they could be charged with a new felony. Or they'll talk about, you know, in Minnesota they were talking about a 10 year waiting period, which is what you have for a firearm ownership. Um, but there's, there's misinformation and, and you're risk averse, you know, that it's sort of like, you know, if you're a prisoner, I asked about other forms of political action and, you know, prisoners didn't want, or former prisoners didn't want to demonstrate. They didn't want to be risk being arrested and having all sorts of bad things unfold. And so, so part of the counterfactual question to me is, well, it's, 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 it's partly about whether they would vote if they were given the right now, but it's, it's whether they would vote if they had never lost that right. Then it, that's a different question. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, and, and I would say the poll workers have gotten better around the country on this, but a lot of times people will give misinformation at the poll. And, you know, I've, I've heard, you know, people will call in and say, on, on, vote, on election day and say, well, you, um, you can't vote if you have a felony conviction with no further elaboration on that. And, you know, that is a... Uh, 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 I would say that that's one of the areas where there's kind of these compromise bills that get passed where you'll have to notify and provide registration assistance. That's what we have in Minnesota. So people get a, um, uh, a card or a form that tells them, you know, they, they are now eligible to vote. Um, that's, fairly, that's fairly new. Um, but, you know, one of, one of my students is formerly incarcerated and when he went off, he was. Uh, he got one of those forms that said he was eligible to vote. He said, "No, I'm not." Like he, they, they had the dates wrong, you know. And and the um, so getting those systems all talking to each other is one thing. But I th I think you're right. That you know, and that's a barrier that is going to vary quite a bit 
um, from state to state. And I, I will say, you know, some other kind of important figures in these debates on uh, 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 have been Jeb Bush was was a just a a strong proponent of disenfranchisement, and he would personally hear the cases where people would be trying to get their civil rights restored, um, uh, and and it was. Um, you know, in Florida, it was a, a large volume, but was very much um, dug in on this issue that, that there are um, there are folks for whom you know this is a uh, a high priority a high priority issue, and not just in Florida, but around the country. Yeah. yeah. So I have two questions. Yeah. Um, one is. Um, has the American Legislative Exchange Council taken a position specifically on felon disenfranchisement? And the second one's connected yeah. with what you were just talking about. Mm -hmm. In some states, you have to petition to get your um, voting rights back. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering if there's research on uh, what types of mm -hmm. felons do petition and what types of petitions are approved by whatever body has to approve. Yeah, the the um, uh, on the first case, on the first question, I don't know. That's I, I, that's I'm going to have to Google, you know. So so I have to be honest. I, that I, I'm not sure if they've taken a position. The I, I it's I seem to remember a position against lifetime or indefinite disenfranchisement, um, but I, but I, I can't. I'm not I'm not I'm not sure on that. I know you know some Eric Holder was very strong on. Um, uh, suggesting that the permanent uh, uh, that we eliminate the permanent the permanent bans, um, and 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 you know so we 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 have um, uh, but I know that there's there's a lot of differences around, among the states. That the story about who gets who applies to get their rights back, this is very interesting. Like when I so I pulled a sample of a thousand cases in Florida of people who had been applying and the. Um, and did a, an analysis for racial bias and other and other things, but the um, it, perhaps not surprisingly, when whites applied, it was often for restoration of civil rights for firearms purposes. Um, African Americans, it was much more likely to be for voting. Um, the uh, uh, they depending on the um, era in which it was done, they had to report their income, they had to report their um, their work history, etc. And and it. it in some cases, they would even do an investigation um, out of the probation and parole office. They don't do this anymore, but but there were letters in the files about uh, people who said, "Please stop investigating. I don't want to vote," because they were going to the employer and talking about a, a previous a previous offense or or uh, uh, you know or or a, a wife um, who didn't even know about it. So. It was uh, it was a very invasive kind of process, and that's a lot of the move in in states like Florida is to streamline to make it a form, a one pager that you can fill out. And if you've not had any offending in recent years or something, that you would be approved, you know, fairly simply. But but that that never materialized. I you know I looked at what they said they were going to do and predicted what the numbers would look like and, and they just never re-enfranchised that many people and you know there's um, occasionally around election time you'll see these pictures of folks with bankers boxes stacked up with applications and they'll just say well we don't have the staff to do it etc um, but but automating it is clearly what uh, groups like the Brennan Center and some of the other you know, more progressive uh, uh, folks uh, have been advocating. Good questions. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm just gonna let you know how naive I am. I uh, I thought that uh, you know if I had a, a right to something that no piece of paper provided that for me, that I just had it and I couldn't. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't take it from me. It's you know I actually have it. No. So. You know, from a layman, you know, uh, why do we call this voting thing a right? Isn't it more like a privilege if it's something I can just yank from you? you know? Yeah. Well, I'm just I, trying to be consistent here with our with our lexicon. You know, I I think that's a fair question. I mean, it is it is, and that's that's as I see, kind of the 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 um, 
the question I'll get outside the United States. I mean, there is a, um, the states have a lot of latitude on, on voting rights. And there was a, we saw in the... <laughs> <laughs> there was a powerful precedent in the 1970s, a Rehnquist opinion, um, Richardson v. Ramirez, I think it was, the, um, uh, that uh, uh, carved out this exception. Now, if what, one of the legal theories that one of my students made was that um, if voting is, if, if voting is a fundamental right, it should get strict scrutiny, and this would not pass, you know, given all of these disparities and, and effects, that this would not pass strict scrutiny. Um, there's, there are lots of theories, like, I mean, legal theories being advanced to try to challenge it. Usually what it comes down to in the cases I'm involved with, you have to prove that at the time they passed that law, that it was under the Voting Rights Act, that it was racially motivated. Now we have law professors here who can elaborate, but, but the, 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 um, uh, but, but the, but we don't have the set, we don't have a, uh, uh, a set of rights of the sort that I think you and I might like to see. And so the, uh, 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 so it is conditional in a way that is not, um, and, and it's certainly not inviolable. Yeah. The, the penal system as a whole is an example of a way in which what we think of as fundamental rights are yeah. not absolute, right? I mean, if right. you think of the right to liberty, which you don't require a piece of paper to have, at least. Mm -hmm. but, but that's the point, is that yeah. we, in fact, as a society, will deprive any person we choose of any mm -hmm. one of those rights. If society chooses to do so, we will execute people, depriving them of life. We will deprive right. them of liberty for the duration of their mortal life, if we choose to. The question is, do we have a process to yeah. do that? that we respect. And then yeah. there are a lot of complicated questions here about mm -hmm. the voting process and the voting rights and at what point we're going to do it. Well, and there is, in yeah. fact, no explicit provision in the Constitution right. that guarantees the right to vote, although it's now mm -hmm. been mm -hmm. um, established that it's implicit. There. The, yeah, there was, a, there was a historical scenario in which I think you could have seen during the wave of civil rights legislation in the 1960s and 70s that these laws had fallen. And maybe some of those cases could have gone the other way. I, I think the, 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 other, the other issue that in collateral sanctions like this, one, one of the challenges has been that they're not viewed as punishment. And that even, and, and the, the court is, some, some courts at least are starting to think of them as punishment, particularly in deportation, if you're going to you know, take somebody out of the country. Well, that certainly seems like punishment rather than something that just happens along the side. But, but that's, that's also an area that makes this a tricky uh, uh, legal, a, a legal, legal area. But you know, I, as I say, I think right now it's, it's, as you can see, it's politically contested. And, and things have been moving in the direction toward reenfranchisement, um, but there's also forces that would very much like to narrow the electorate. And this is one way to do it against a very stigmatized group. You know? And so I, I, I would say it's, it's, not, it's not dead. I mean, and the, and the, um, you know, the, the, uh, the hist in, in a way, you know, it's a remnant of an earlier era in which we had the steady progression in which the franchise was extended to more and more groups um, to near universal suffrage. And this is an exception. Well, it could be used as an exception to widen uh, or, or widen disenfranchisement or narrow the electorate further. Um, you know, it, 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 it's held that exceptional legal status. Um, and it's, it's uh, 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 when, I, when we were writing the, the, the book in like 2005, 2006, we thought, well, the door is kind of just hanging on some rusty hinges here. 
and it's 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 going to fall over. I, I no longer think that. I mean, I just see it as as far more contested today than I did. Um, and what do I know? I mean, I, you know, I'm not a I'm not a politician, and I'm not a lawyer. Um, but I, I, I the conversations have have been different in, in recent years. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I feel like I could provide some kind of good reason as to why I should deny you life and liberty. But uh, can you provide me with a good positive argument as to why you should take away my ability to vote for the rest of my life, like Florida or whatever? I, yeah. I haven't heard a good argument for that, like some, some reasoning behind that. I, I mean, I know it's, that's, that's just what it is. Okay, that's fine, but why is that the case? Mm -hmm. I mean, is there a good reason-giving right. argument that would compel me to be like, oh, yeah, that's a good point. Maybe we should take away their right to you, vote. You sound like reviewer B. Reviewer B is always saying, you know, um, you're not giving the other side a fair shake. Well, you're no, not, I mean, you're I, not I just don't fair know. To, and, and there is a there is a gentleman named Roger Clegg who who argues um, these issues. You know, I've had exchanges with him. Um, that 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 the logic though is that um, it's kind of a one bad apple logic of, of the democracy that if you have somebody who's tainted um, that you are uh, causing problems. Now there is, a, there is a bigger picture social contract logic that once you've violated, you've shown yourself to not be trustworthy as a citizen, we should not permit you to make decisions for the rest of us. The, the, uh, 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 now I think, you know, as I said, the, the, what we know about the life course, what we know about people, um, uh, uh, that crime is episodic, that everybody desists from crime eventually, et cetera, doesn't, doesn't favor that argument. So I don't make it, I don't, it, it's not one that, you know, I find particularly compelling, but I will say that's, that's how the, that's how it's framed. Um, but I, you know, I, I think part of it its political appeal is we don't want those people to vote. And whether those people are people of color, whether those people are you know, recently arrived immigrants, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I will say I've seen the briefing sheets from, for example, uh, uh, Republican Party briefing sheets. One of them said, um, you know, might be good, good policy, bad politics. So it was, it was very much an appeal to, look, this is not in our interest to change these laws. Now, so I, I, I would say, you know, that's a, um, uh, uh, that's a terrible way to end on. I, I'm not gonna, can you say something? You know, on Valentine's Day and, you know, um, where's the love? But, but, it, but I think sometimes, you know, in the, um, all sides in politics play some of these games, and, and you know that you're going to uh, you're going to shift the balance of power, and that's what happened after the Civil War. You shifted the balance of power, and disenfranchising measures were taken. Right? And I think holding holding us accountable to those to the values and the vision uh, 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 of American democracy, I think, is a good thing. And it does often win the hearts and minds, as you saw in the public opinion poll. And, and I think keeping the uh, attention there will, the door, the door might, the hinges might have been tightened up a little bit, but the door's not coming, slamming back at.